Hello students and welcome back to Political Science 1513 American Federal Government. I'm still your instructor, Connor Alford, and in this video we're going to begin to talk about some of the colonial history that helped set the stage for the American Revolution and the American War for Independence. We're going to talk about the Articles of Confederation and we're going to discuss how its weaknesses helped to lead to an event called Shays' Rebellion and the eventual drafting of the United States Constitution as we set the stage for next week's lecture. Towards this end, we've got a series of four major learning objectives that I would like you to focus on as you begin to take notes and move through this video. The first learning objective asks for you to explain how early colonial experiences helped to develop some of America's core political beliefs, attitudes, values, and traditions. The second learning objective asks for you to distinguish between the American Revolution and the American War for Independence, while the third learning objection asks for you to trace the events, grievances, ideas, and other values behind the American Revolution and the American War for Independence. Finally, the fourth learning objective asks for you to explain how the perceived weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation help lead to the birth of our Constitution. We're going to go ahead and begin with the first learning objective, and that means we're going to start by talking about colonial experiences in the early historical periods of British settlement in North America. We're going to start with Jamestown, and we're going to talk about local sovereignty. We're going to discuss the Mayflower Compact and the concept of a social contract. We're going to breeze over about 170 years of independence, and then we're going to begin talking about some of the grievances that led up to the American Revolution and the American Revolutionary War in the next segment. So let's go ahead and get started by looking at the first sort of permanent British settlement on the North American continent. That's going to be Jamestown, and although you don't need to memorize this year for test purposes, it was founded in 1607. Now, Jamestown is an interesting, it is an interesting experience because it is a permanent settlement in the sense that it has residence year-round. But I want you to understand that it was not meant to be a permanent settlement in the sense that it was going to create an independent or a new society. Nobody's thinking about an independent America at this time. Uh, in fact, if you actually have done your reading, then you already know that all of the original colonists sent to Jamestown were men. Well, that's because they're not trying to create a new permanent society that's going to last from generation to generation. I want you to understand that Jamestown is essentially a sort of trading post. The purpose of Jamestown Jamestown is to exploit the abundant resources that are very common in the North American continent, but that are quite rare and therefore very valuable back in Europe at this time and at this stage in history. I want you to understand that Jamestown was a product of a contract between a London-based group of entrepreneurs called the Virginia Company on the one hand and the British Crown and Parliament, the government, on the other hand. See, this joint public-private endeavor was designed to make everybody filthy, stinking rich. And this is significant because what we're going to find is that basically the Crown needs the Virginia Company to foot the bill to cover the initial expenses necessary to ferry settlers across the Atlantic Ocean and create Jamestown. The Crown doesn't have the money to do this, but it does want to begin exploiting the resources the wealth of North America for its own benefit. So the Crown asks the Virginia Company to go and gather those resources to foot the bill necessary to cover startup costs and then bring those resources back and sell them in places where the Crown can begin generating revenue by taxing the transactions. And the Virginia Company agrees. It says, okay, we're going to cover the startup costs and we will sell our goods in places where you will have the ability to tax those transactions. But in exchange, we want certain monopoly rights when it comes to transactions involving certain resources that we have collected in North America. The Crown agrees. And in this agreement, we find in this contract between the Virginia Company and the British government a really important clause which basically says that the Virginia Company will have full power and authority to make all laws governing daily life in Jamestown. And that's very important for you to understand because if you don't know, the full power and authority to make all laws governing day-to-day -day life in a particular area is what you call sovereignty. 
And therefore, what we're going to discover is that from the start, the British colonists in North America are going to begin to become accustomed to local sovereignty. They are governing themselves. They are not following the same rules or paying the same taxes as British citizens in London or Edinburgh or really in any other part of the empire. All of the rules governing day-to-day -day life in Jamestown are going to be created by Jamestown. So the colonists begin to become accustomed to their own independent governance, to their own local sovereignty. And that's important. But it's also important to understand that the Virginia Company decided to exercise this full power and authority to make laws, this local sovereignty, in a really unique and historically significant way. See, everyone kind of expected that Jamestown would just be run like a company town. They would appoint a manager, they'd call him the governor, and he'd tell everyone what to do on a day-to-day -day basis, but that's not what happens. Instead, the Virginia Company decides that it is going to let the settlers in Jamestown elect their own decision makers, and that these decision makers would represent the community on a council that creates all of the rules. So what we're going to find is that not only are the British colonists in North America beginning to become accustomed to local independent sovereignty, but they are also starting to develop their capacity for democratic problem solving. They are beginning to become accustomed to and to take for granted representative government made up of individuals that they selected and who, because this is very local, they probably know on a first name basis. So Jamestown is significant first because this is where the colonists begin to develop their affinity for local independent sovereignty, and second because this is where the colonists begin to enter into the belief that representative government is the proper model for government authority. But we're not done yet. We've got a lot of history to cover. So fast forwarding about 13 years, you get your next major colony created by the British in North America. And that's going to be Plymouth. Now you've probably heard a little bit about the Pilgrims and their trip to Plymouth Rock, and some of that's probably quite accurate. Some of it might be a little misleading. So let's take a moment to talk about who these religious separatists, who these Pilgrims were. First, I want you to understand that yes, they were Pilgrims, and yes, they were fleeing religious persecution back in Europe. They didn't like the way things were being run, and they wanted them to be run differently, so they decide, hey, we're going to travel to this new continent, and we're going to build a new society based on our religious beliefs so that we can worship God in the way that we see fit, and we can organize our society in the way that we believe is proper and good and pleasing to God. But I don't want you to think that because these were religious separatists seeking to escape persecution and separate themselves from the Anglican Church that they believed in a separation of church and state. That's not true. See, at this time, the British government had already decided that their official religion would be the Anglican Church. But at this point in history, basically all of the sort of very zealous, fervent believers within that church are dissatisfied with the way it's being run because the Anglican Church had become more of a political and less of a spiritual or biblical institution. And so there was corruption, and nobody liked that. Therefore, some of the more ardent believers within the Anglican Church began to split into factions. One faction is what today we call the Puritans. And these are the very adamant Christians, the very fervent or zealous Christians, who said, look, the church has become corrupted, and so we need to purify it and ourselves of these corrupting earthly influences in order to correct it and make it more pleasing to God. So the Puritans want to purify the Anglican church of corruption from the inside out. But the separatists, they say, no, look, this, this has gone too far. They're beginning to persecute us. They're not letting us purify it. This cannot be saved. It's time to uh, sink the ship and move on. We need to separate and create an entirely new religious society based on our interpretation of the gospel, based on our interpretation of the scriptures, based on our version of Christianity. So they are separatists in that they want a separate society based on their version of Christianity, not in the sense that they believed in a separation of church and state. They absolutely did not, and they would have found that idea horribly repugnant, offensive, immoral, and unacceptable. So they don't necessarily believe in religious freedom in the sense that we would think of it today, but they are fleeing religious persecution. They are trying to create a new society based on their version of Christianity so that they can practice their own belief systems 
independent of undue influence, coercion, and subjugation. Uh, but it's also worth noting that uh, these separatists were basically a bunch of pacifists, and they were essentially a bunch of merchants and artisans who knew that they didn't have the skill sets necessary to survive in what they regarded as an untamed wilderness. That's to say nothing of the fact that they were terrified of the indigenous populations of the Native American tribes, which they literally thought of as satanic forces of evil. So they didn't want to land in an area where there would be anarchy. They're leaving behind the only form of law and order they have ever known, but they don't want to enter into anarchy. So the original plan is that they're going to land in the Chesapeake Bay area, not far from Jamestown, and then they can kind of piggyback off of the law and order that the Virginia company has already established in that area. Doesn't work out. Storm blows them off course. They land in Massachusetts. And so uh, before they disembark, before they put their feet on dry land, they have to take a moment and talk things out because they know that as long as they're on the ships, they're under maritime law. There is a clear chain of command. There is law and order. We know who's in charge. It's the captain. But the captain no longer has authority once we've disembarked. So before we put our feet on dry land, we need to get together and talk about how we are going to protect ourselves from anarchy, from chaos. So they gather together on the deck of their flagship, the Mayflower, and they sign what is called the Mayflower Compact. Basically, the Mayflower Compact is an agreement where all of the heads of household, all of the men, come together. And they unanimously say, they unanimously agree to affix their name to a document stating that there will be a form of central authority, there will be law and order, and they are all going to agree to follow the rules created by this centralized authority. Now, you might have been told at some point in the past that the Mayflower Compact was the first constitution. That's not accurate. It's not a charter or a blueprint of government. But it is, historically speaking, very important for two major reasons. First, I want you to understand that the Mayflower Compact is important because even though it's not a constitution, it is a sort of legal governing document. And what that means is that starting at Plymouth, the colonists are beginning to develop their capacity for statescraft. They're learning to draft their own rules, to draft their own governing documents, and that means that they're gaining more independence. They're no longer dependent upon the British Parliament or Crown to tell them how to run business, what laws to make, or how to run a state. But even more importantly, I want you to understand that the Mayflower Compact is significant second because it is history's best and most explicit example of a successful social contract as a functioning basis for governing authority. So what is a social contract? What does this mean? Well, a social contract is an implicit or explicit agreement among the members of a society to cooperate under some sort of centralized authority in exchange for the benefits that such an authority can provide. In other words, they're all going to agree not to take each other's things because then they know that they're relatively secure in their belongings. They're agreeing that there will be a government, there will not be anarchy, and everyone is saying, I will follow the rules of this government. So once they're on dry land, why do they have to follow the rules of the government? Because they agreed to do so. So this social contract, this Mayflower Compact, tells us then that the source of government legitimacy and authority is the consent of the governed. The governed, the pilgrims, need to follow the government's rules because they agreed to do so. They consented to do so. And that's not the way things are being run in Europe. I right, see back in Europe, there is a divine right to rule. Why do I have to follow the king's decrees? Why do I have to comply with parliament? Because God put them in charge, and because God has decided to appoint the king, then he is legitimate. He has authority by divine right to rule, by divine appointment. And that's not the way things are happening here. And that's really, really important. It's really important to understand that starting with the Mayflower Compact, the British colonists in North America begin to recognize that the social contract is a valid and functioning basis for governing authority, and that legitimate government is therefore government by the consent of the governed. And if government derives its authority from the people, then power ultimately rests not with a king, not even with a parliament, but rather with the people themselves. Fast forwarding over a hundred years, the last of the original 13 colonies is going to be Georgia, and it's founded in 1732. 
Now this isn't a history class, so we're really going to skim over the surface here, but there are a few points that I want to make. First I want you to understand that during this century or so between Georgetown and uh, I'm sorry, Jamestown and Plymouth on the one hand, Georgia on the other hand, the colonists, the British colonists in North America are being more or less left alone. The Crown doesn't care what rules govern day-to-day -day life in Georgia, Massachusetts, or Virginia as long as the goods keep on coming and they're still getting filthy rich. And at this point, hey, they're still getting filthy rich. So things are working out and therefore they allow the colonists in North America to continue governing themselves independently at the local level. Virginia is governed by Virginia, Massachusetts is governed by the Massachusetts House of Burgesses, so on and so forth. And this means that by the time of the American Revolution, some of these colonies had enjoyed local representative sovereignty and independence from British interference for about a century. And they're going to use this independence. They're going to use this local sovereignty in ways that help them to become better and more competent statesmen so they continue to develop their experience. And that's important to recognize. But just as important, I want you to understand that they use their local sovereignty to do new and radical things like protect individual liberties. And that development of this belief that individuals are entitled to certain freedoms, which develops during this point in American history, is another very important idea to keep in the back of your mind. It is perhaps best exemplified in what we call the Massachusetts Bodies of Liberty. And the Massachusetts Body of Liberties basically said, hey, look, if you are a Massachusetts citizen, you are entitled to certain freedoms that the government cannot take away. So we begin to develop a belief that individuals have certain freedoms, but hey, this is really important and very closely related to that idea of the social contract. Because when you start creating legal protections for individual liberties, really what you're doing is you're creating rules for governing authorities. If I say that you have a freedom of speech, then what I'm really doing is I'm telling the government that it cannot censor you. If I say that you have a freedom of religion, I am telling the government that it is not allowed to prevent you from practicing your beliefs or compel you to practice somebody else's beliefs. So in developing this value for individual liberties with legal protections, the colonists are also beginning to develop their affinity for limited government. They're beginning to develop a belief that there are certain things that the government should not be allowed to do to us or take away from us. And why is it that the colonists are able to begin doing things like saying, hey, there are rules that government has to follow? Because remember, that's not how things work back in Europe. In Europe, the king tells you what to do and you obey. You don't make rules for the king, he makes rules for you. You don't tell the king what he can and cannot do, he tells you what you cannot, can and cannot do. But now these colonists are turning around and they're making rules for the government saying, you're going to respect our freedoms. Well, they're able to do this because remember, in their mind, in their mind, the legitimate basis of government authority is the consent of the governed. And the thing about consent is that first off, it can be withdrawn, but second off, it can also come with strings attached. You can say things like, hey, I agree to follow your rules as long as you respect my freedom of speech and religion. If you start violating those, I don't consent to that, but as long as you respect them, yeah, sure, I will follow the rules. And that means that you get to create limits on the proper use of government authority. The consent of the governed is not a blanket permission to do whatever you want. Rather, it is a qualified concession. So that's going to bring us to an end when it comes to the discussion of some of the early colonial experience. And that's how things work again for the first century or so. But we, we, we know that that's not how things are going to continue to work. Eventually problems are going to crop up. And so uh, in this next segment of the lecture, we're going to begin to talk about the American Revolution, the American War for Independence and its aftermath. Uh, we're going to talk about what the American Revolution was, what caused the American Revolution and the War for Independence. We're going to discuss our first charter of government, the Articles of Confederation. And we're going to discuss how their weaknesses helped lead to an event called Chase Rebellion, which ultimately sets the stage for the Constitutional Convention. We'll briefly touch upon next week. So I want you to note that problems begin to emerge in the 1760s, uh, well the 1750s and 60s really, with the advent of what we call the French and Indian War.
The French and Indian War was a territorial conflict between the French and their Indian allies on the one hand, the British and their Indian allies on the other hand. And basically what they're fighting over is control over North America because there are certain areas of North America that at this point in history are claimed by the French and there are certain areas that are claimed by the British. The French are coming from the west and working their way east. The British are coming from the west working their way in the, I'm sorry, from the east working their way west. And uh, they, they begin to butt heads. They begin to expand into contested territory. The French respond to what they see as British incursions into their territory by rallying their Native American allies and instigating raids on British colonies. The British colonists respond in kind, things escalate, and they begin to fight. But this creates problems for the British colonists because, remember, they're a bunch of artisans and Puritans and pacifists. They don't actually have any standing military. And they are not prepared to fight a war with the French and their Indian allies. So this doesn't go very well for them. The French are kicking their butts. And therefore, uh, they, they appeal to the crown. And they say, hey, Mr. King, remember that we are still proud, loyal British subjects. We're Englishmen, and you're the English king. Therefore, it is your job to come and protect us from this foreign aggressor. And the king, he thinks about that for a moment. He says, you know what? You are still British subjects. I am still your king. It is still my duty to protect my subjects from foreign aggressors. So I'm going to do that. And he do. He spends a whole bunch of money. He borrows about 150 pounds in uh, money so that he can fund a war effort. Sends this standing army to the North American continent and fights a war with the French, which really ends in a sort of stalemate in 1763. At the end of the war, there's no clear victor. Fighting has stopped, but nobody's really satisfied with the outcome, least of all the British crown, because here's the thing. In borrowing that 150 million pounds sterling, the crown had really indebted itself to other powers like Spain. And these other powers, after the war was ended, expected the crown to begin paying them back the money that it had borrowed, and it can't afford to do so. So it has to start looking for new ways to raise revenue. Because at this time, that's a massive, that's an empire-devastating amount of debt. And so to keep this debt from expanding, they decide, first of all, we need to do something to prevent further acts of aggression that will instigate another war between our colonists and the French in North America. And they do this with the Proclamation Act of 1763, which basically tells these colonists, you cannot expand any further because as you expand, you're going to begin creating new problems and new conflicts with the French. So it prohibits further westward expansion. Uh, this is a major issue if you're a colonist at this point in the British-controlled portions of North America. Because the colonists in North America operated on a system of indentured servitude, where basically you might be a convict or an indigent person back in London, and you want a new take on life. You want to start over. And so you go to a company and they say, hey, look, we're going to pay to ship you to North America. In exchange, you will agree to be our servant, to work for free for a period of about seven years, during which we will provide room and board, and at the end of which, we're going to give you your own plot of land. So a whole bunch of people have agreed to come over here and work for seven years in exchange for getting their own land at the end of that period. And then the Crown says you can't claim any more land. So they've worked their seven years, but there's no more territory for them to claim because that's going to stir up the Native Americans and that's going to create conflict with the French. So the colonists don't like the proclamation of 1763. But things really start to escalate the next year, beginning with what we call the Sugar Act. The Sugar Act basically enforced existing regulations and duties on imports and exports of certain goods like molasses. And so it's not really a direct tax. But it is frustrating for the colonists, and I want you to take a moment and think about why. All right, so first off, understand that this is not a particularly burdensome or excessive tax. It is a simple uh, sort of tariff. It is a duty that actually lowered existing duties and simply started enforcing them. And it's not arbitrary. Right? From the Crown's perspective, 
It's only fair that because the colonists were the primary beneficiaries of the war that put them in horrible debt, those colonists should then have to start paying back some of their fair share of the expenses incurred. And it is worth noting that at this time, if you are a British colonist in North America, your tax burden is lower than that of basically any other British person anywhere else in the empire. So why are the colonists angry? Well, because this is seen by them as an attack on some of those beliefs, values, expectations, and traditions that we've been talking about. Right? They're accustomed to being left alone, and starting in 1763 and then escalating in 1764, that's not happening anymore. So this is where we can begin to talk just a little bit about the American Revolution. I want you to understand that the American Revolution and the American Revolutionary War or War for Independence are not actually the same thing. The American Revolution was an intellectual revolution in the British colonies of North America, which took place before, during, and after the American War for Independence, and which centered on the values, beliefs, systems, and principles developed during the colonial era in our country's history, which are best enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. These are things like local sovereignty, independence, individual liberties, equal rights, limited government, so on and so forth. So what we're finding is what Thomas Jefferson, I'm sorry, what John Adams wrote to a letter wrote in a letter to Thomas Jefferson in 1815. The revolution was in the minds of the people, and this was affected from 1760 to 1775 in the course of 15 years before a drop of blood was drawn at Lexington. In other words, because of all of these experiences we've been talking about, the colonists are beginning to develop their own ideas about government and their own way of life, which they are fiercely defensive of. For this reason, the American Revolutionary War is often considered a conservative revolution because the colonists are fighting to conserve a way of life to which they have become accustomed through an intellectual revolution that we now know as the American Revolution. The American Revolution was an intellectual transformation in the way that people thought about themselves, proper government authority, and the proper way to run business. So we get the American Revolution and then boom! All of these values, this new mindset is under assault by the proclamation of 1763 and the Sugar Act. And then in 1765, things, things continue to get worse because now we get the Stamp Act. And this is the first internal tax levied directly on colonists by the British Parliament back in London. Right? The Act imposed a tax on all paper documents in the colonies. And it came at a time when the British Empire was deep in debt from the Seven Years' War and looking to the North American colonies as a source of revenue. Now again, from the Crown's perspective, this is only fair. The colonists were the primary beneficiaries of the war against the French, and therefore they should help pay back some of the debts. Again, this is a very modest tax. It's not particularly sizable, but it definitely upsets people because, again, it is seen as a threat to local independence. Right? Uh, after the Stamp Act of 1765, right, uh, we, we, we get that rallying cry, no taxation without representation. It doesn't say no taxation. It says no taxation without representation. The colonists were accustomed to paying taxes. They levied taxes on themselves all the time. But if they were going to pay a tax, they wanted it to be a local tax levied by their elected officials who they could replace if they were unhappy with the decisions that those elected officials were making. That's not happening in Parliament. They've got no representation. So the colonists are upset. Their values, the American revolutionary values, ideas, expectations, and traditions, this way of life, they're being challenged, and they respond in 1765, in October, with what we call the Stamp Act Congress. Uh, the Stamp Act Congress was an extra-legal convention made up of delegates from nine different colonies. It met in October of 1765 to discuss how the colonies should work together in response to the Stamp Act in particular, but the incursions against local sovereignty and American independence in, uh, in general. Uh, so the Stamp Act Congress wrote a series of petitions to the king, and in these petitions they affirmed their loyalty. They said, look, we're still proud, loyal 
British citizens, we're Englishmen, and uh, th that's great. But stop taxing us. We don't want you to do this anymore. And as they were trying to get Parliament to withdraw this tax without representation, they realized that they, they needed to do something a little more. It wasn't enough to petition them. So the really important thing that the Stamp Act Congress is going to do is it's going to organize a series of colonies-wide boycotts against British goods affected by the Stamp Act in an attempt to get the Parliament to repeal this new tax. And this is significant for two major reasons. So first off, I want you to understand that these boycotts organized by the Stamp Act Congress of 1765 are significant because this is the first time that you see the colonists working together across the boundaries of their own colonies. Right? At this point in history, understand that there was local sovereignty. There is no America. There is Virginia. There is Georgia. And there is Massachusetts, there's Pennsylvania, but a person from Pennsylvania would have no more in common with a person from Massachusetts at this time than today we might have, Americans might have, with a person from Canada. Right? So the Canadians, let's be clear, just like Americans today, have British roots. They come from the same place. So there are some ties between us, but Canadians and Americans don't look at one another as countrymen. They are separate communities. They are separate sovereigns. There's Canada and then there's America. And we have very different values and ideas about government, life, so on and so forth. The colonists were the same way. Georgians did not tend to see themselves as kinsmen to or as countrymen with Massachusetts people, except perhaps in that they were all commonly British. So the Stamp Act Congress is significant because this is the first time that the colonists begin to develop a sense of common identity and they begin to work together. The second reason that the Stamp Act Congress's boycotts are so significant is that they work. And this is emboldening. It shows the colonies that when they work together, they can move mountains, they can get a lot done, and they can get their way. And when I tell you they work, that's because in 1766, you get the Declaratory Act. And the Declaratory Act basically repealed the Stamp Act. The colonists got their way. However, it is also worth noting that it was a qualified success because while the Stamp Act was repealed by the Declaratory Act, the Declaratory Act also reasserted that Parliament's authority to tax the colonists in North America was the same as their authority to tax any other British subject. So they are reasserting their authority to tax the colonists even as they are making a concession on the Stamp Act. And to further illustrate this point, we get in 1773 the Tea Act. Right? So early 1773, uh, Parliament creates a new tax on tea imports to the colonies in North America. And I want you to understand that... Uh, the nature of this act was such that it actually lowered the cost of tea. tea. Tea became more affordable after the Tea Act. It was a very, very modest tax. Because this is no longer about money. This is about showing the colonists who's boss. Because the king is ticked off. He feels that the colonists are like unruly teenagers challenging his parental authority. He's the dad, they're the children, they need to be reminded who's boss. And so he creates... He works with Parliament to create a new tax targeting the number one import of the colonists. Tea at this time was a household item. People drank it with every meal. And so this is the Parliament and the Crown, this is the British Empire, trying to remind on a very day-to-day -day basis, in a very intimate way, the colonists in North America, that they still need to do what Daddy tells them to do. And that's going to create a reaction. We get escalation. And the first major response to the Tea Act that we need to talk about for the purposes of our lecture is what you know as the Boston Tea Party. All right, the Boston Tea Party is going to happen later that same year. So we're still in 1773, but we've moved forward to the month of December. And basically what you get are a group of patriots known as the Sons of Liberty. The Sons of Liberty were a group of colonial merchants and tradesmen. These are artisans. These are the types of people who have enough money that they're going to be affected very intimately by these new taxes. 
and the organization was founded to protest first the Stamp Act and then other forms of taxation. And after the Tea Act, the group is so enraged that they organize a form of protest, a sort of riot, if you will. Because what they do is they disguise themselves as Native Americans. And then in Massachusetts, they go to the port and they attack a British ship. They seize a British ship importing tea and other goods affected by these new taxes. And then they fling them into the ocean. They dump them into the water, doing massive, massive amounts of property damage, something like $4 million, or the equivalent of $4 million today, in property damage. Now, there are a few things that I want you to know about this event and about the Sons of Liberty. First, I want you to understand that their actions were broadly condemned by the rest of the colonists. Because at this time, the vast majority of the colonists are not interested in independence. They're still proud, loyal British subjects. They regard these individuals, the Sons of Liberty, in much the same way that today we might regard people who riot in the streets to protest an election or storm a Capitol building. They're unruly, they're dangerous, they're a mob, they're essentially treated like domestic terrorists. And broadly speaking, they don't have popular support. But see, here's the thing, the Sons of Liberty knew that, and they, unlike the general population, were firebrands. They were ready for independence before it was cool. And so they orchestrated the Boston Tea Party intentionally trying to instigate an overreaction by the parliament which will alienate the rest of the colonists so that they, the Sons of Liberty, can then rally their fellow Americans in a cause for independence. And the crown takes the bait. Because the Sons of Liberty disguise themselves, they're not able to identify the particular perpetrators and punish the specific people responsible. So instead, Parliament and the Crown decide that they're going to punish everyone. Now remember, this form of collective punishment is a bit bizarre, at least in the American perspective, because most of these British colonists, these Englishmen in North America, didn't have anything to do with and actively condemn the actions of the Sons of Liberty, but they're all getting affected. And the form of collective punishment comes in a series of four acts, which are known as the Coercive Acts or sometimes the Intolerable Acts. And the Intolerable or Coercive Acts were basically a series of acts established by the British government, which closed the port of Boston, dispatched British soldiers to Massachusetts, required the quartering of these troops, uh, often in private homes, uh, and, and replaced this is important. They replaced the Democratic Assemblies of Massachusetts with a Crown-appointed governor and governor's assembly. So basically, the Crown has completely stripped an entire colony of its local sovereignty, of its independence, independence which it's enjoyed for over a century at this point. And that really terrifies people. The Crown justifies this by saying, look, we're restoring law and order. We are punishing the perpetrators of a horrible crime, and we will, in their mind, hopefully isolate Massachusetts from the rest of the colonies to stop them from continuing to cooperate. The other colonies, they thought, would be cowed, they'd be intimidated by this, and not wanting to lose their own dependence, they would step in line. But this is a miscalculation, because instead they call the First Continental Congress in September of 1774. And the First Continental Congress, I, I want you to understand, is not a call for independence. At this point, there's no serious discussion of a revolutionary war. Nobody is prepared for that fight. Nobody thinks we could win it. And most of the individuals present don't actually think that it would be desirable to declare independence, even if that were a reasonable possibility. So Instead of a call for independence, I want you to understand that the First Continental Congress is essentially a meeting of representatives from 12 of the 13 colonies. Georgia wasn't present. They were dealing with a Native American uprising. But it's a meeting of delegates from almost all of the colonies to get together and discuss how those colonies should respond to the intolerable acts. Those acts are intolerable. They don't like them. Um, but they're not trying to declare independence. Instead, they're trying to negotiate. They're saying, hey, what can we do domestically to address these problems? And so, first of all, they petition the king and they say, hey, please go to parliament and tell them to knock it off, repeal the intolerable acts, leave us alone, and let us enjoy our independence. But they're also going to make two other fateful and very important decisions. 
So the two important decisions made at the First Continental Congress for the purpose of our lecture is first, they ask each of the colonies to begin stockpiling weapons, and second, they ask each of the colonies to establish a militia. Now remember, remember that the First Continental Congress is not a call for independence. They're not gearing up for revolution, or at least they don't see themselves as gearing up for a revolution. So why then are they asking the colonies to begin assembling their own militias and arming their own militias? Well, remember that all of this started, this long train of abuses and usurpations against the American revolutionary values of independence, representation, so on and so forth, all of this began with the proclamation of 1763 and the Sugar Act of 1764 and the Stamp Act of 1765, which were the Parliament's response to the French and Indian War. So basically, the Crown says, look, we accumulated a massive amount of debt in order to protect you, so you need to help us pay that debt back. The First Continental Congress decision to begin building local militias and arming local militias is basically the colonists saying, okay, well, you know what? If that's the cost of your protection, we're going to fix the problem right now. We will protect ourselves, and then you won't accumulate debt. Problem solved. Leave us alone. But that's not how the Crown sees it. The Crown sees the colonists beginning to arm their own militia and interprets that as preparation for war. And so what does the king do? Well, he begins dispatching more troops. He refuses to negotiate on any of the taxes. He ignores and rejects their petition. And so the First Continental Congress says, okay, you know what? We, we're going to have to meet again because things are escalating. And by the time that we get the Second Continental Congress, early in 1775, now fighting has actually started. Right? Patrick Henry has given his famous give me liberty or give me death speech. We've had the shot heard around the world. We, 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 we've got people who are essentially rioting. We've got people who are lynching tax officials, who are tarring and feathering government appointees, governors sent over by the crown. Things are getting violent. They're escalating. And so the 13 colonies each send delegates together to meet in the Second Continental Congress and discuss what are we going to do. At the Second Continental Congress, there are legitimate calls for independence. But I want you to note that these calls for independence were the voice of a minority. Most of the delegates in attendance still didn't want a war for independence. Now, the reason that there was so much resistance had less to do with their loyalty to the crown, however, and more to do with their fear that they couldn't win. The British Empire at this point was the most powerful empire in human history. It controlled something like a fourth of the world's landmass and a fourth of the world's population. And they were a bunch of farmers that until the preceding September hadn't even begun to establish their own militias. They barely started training soldiers. So they don't think they can win. And therefore, at the Second Continental Congress, they're going to make a last-ditch effort to reach a negotiated resolution, a civil and diplomatic resolution to the disagreements between the colonists and what they regard as their government. This last ditch effort to reach a peaceful diplomatic resolution comes in the form of the Olive Branch Petition, which was sent to King George by the Second Continental Congress. The Olive Branch Petition did a couple of important things. Number one, it reasserted the loyalty and the submission of the colonists to British authority. The colonists said, look, we're still Englishmen, we're still loyal, and we recognize that you have authority over us. But second, the Olive Branch Petition asked King George to negotiate on the details of some of these new regulations and taxes, and in particular those created by the Four Intolerable Acts, the Coercive Acts. The most significant thing about the Olive Branch Petition, however, is its reception. Because the king receives the petition and basically tells the Continental Congress where they can stick their olive branch. He says, you know what? No, I'm not going to negotiate because this is not a democracy. We don't have a representative government based on the consent of the governed. I'm the king. I'm in charge. You do what I tell you. If I say jump, you say how high. Nobody else anywhere in the British Empire thinks that they get to argue with me. 
So again, this is the king saying, look, I'm the dad, you're the children. If I say bedtime is 8 o'clock, you don't ask for me to move it up to 8.30. And when I tell you, no, I'm not moving it up to 8.30, you definitely don't offer to raise it to 8.15. You go to bed at 8. Now, King George thinks that what he's doing is he's putting on a strong face because he believes that a firm hand's what's needed to get the colonists to back down and step in line, to make them behave. But it's a horrible miscalculation because instead what he's done is he's shown the colonists that if they're going to enjoy any of these new beliefs, systems, this entirely separate way of life that they've become accustomed to, they're going to have to fight for it. All right, so you get Thomas Paine's common sense, which says, look, the British Empire is in debt, its armies are divided, this is a great opportunity. If we continue wasting our time hoping for some pie-in-the-sky olive branch petition to reach a negotiated resolution, they're going to consolidate their forces and we're going to lose everything. It's all or nothing, it's time to fight. And so the very next year, July 4th, 1776, the Second Continental Congress drafts and ratifies the Declaration of Independence. And now we're in the American Revolutionary War, the American War for Independence, which is a military struggle to separate the British colonies from the imperial authority of the British Empire. Contrast that with the intellectual events of the American Revolution. The Declaration of Independence, I want you to understand, was not a legally binding document. But it is historically significant for two major reasons. First, the Declaration of Independence signified our legitimacy abroad. It showed foreign powers, and in particular the French, that this is no longer a case of domestic unrest within the British Empire that can be safely ignored. This is a full-on revolutionary war worth their attention. And in this way, the Declaration of Independence played a very pivotal role in helping us to win in the Revolutionary War. Because it was the Declaration of Independence which convinced the French to get involved, mainly by arming and providing guns and ammunition, but later by actually sending soldiers. So the Declaration of Independence helped win the Revolution by signifying our legitimacy abroad. But the second major reason that it's important is that it also signified our legitimacy at home. At this point, there's a great deal of division, even among the soldiers and the militia, about whether declaring independence and fighting to throw off the British government was the right thing to do. Many people were still proud, patriotic Englishmen, and they didn't necessarily feel comfortable trying to shed authority from the crown and parliament that they had always known and respected. But what the Declaration of Independence does is, first off, it lists all of the abuses and tyrannical actions of the government. It lists, it drafts a list of grievances against the king and parliament. And then it explains how these grievances justify declaring independence and fighting for the revolutionary cause using the values of the American Revolutionary War. So remember when I told you that the ideas of the American Revolution are best articulated and enshrined and expressed by the Declaration of Independence? Well, that's because in writing the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson is using these values of freedom, of limited government, of representation, of the social contract, of individual liberties to justify the revolutionary cause. And it works. This convinces a lot of people who are sitting on the fence to jump on the side of the revolutionary cause and eventually the revolution is going to culminate in victory. However, once we've declared independence, we've got a bit of a problem. Because remember, we've already learned from the Continental Congresses and from the Stamp Act Congress that if the colonists are going to stand any chance and achieve their goals, they have to work together. And the only form of unifying authority that bound them together up until this point in history was that of the British Empire, from which they had just declared independence. So now what they need is some form of central, federal authority, right? They're states, they're no longer colonies, and they're state governments, but now they need some form of federal government, federal authority, to help coordinate the war effort so that they can work together as a team and win. The Continental Congress's answer to this problem is the Articles of Confederation, which you can think of as a sort of proto-constitution. This was the first charter of federal government in the history of the United States. It's at this point that we become the United States. Up until this point, we were disunited states, and now all of a sudden we have one central government. 
But I want you to understand uh, that the Articles government, the federal government under the Articles of Confederation, did not look quite like what you might be accustomed to as an American citizen today. So first off, I want you to understand that under the Articles of Confederation, sovereignty, lawmaking authority, fundamentally rested with the states, whereas today under the Constitution it is shared and divided across states and the federal government in a system called federalism. Now, under both the Articles and the Constitution, foreign relations and diplomacy were still handled by the federal government, but taxation was pretty much entirely vested in the states, which meant that states could tax, but the federal government cannot. Contrast that with today, where both the federal government and states can create taxes. Commerce, under the Articles of Confederation, was regulated and controlled by the states, whereas today the states and the federal government work together. Representation was equal. It was equal for each of the states, not for the individuals, whereas it's a little different today. We're not going to talk too much about that right now. It will become more relevant later. Uh, but it is also worth noting that under the Articles of Confederation, the federal Congress could not create any new law or rules unless they got two-thirds of the 13, that's one delegate per state, the 13 delegates to agree. Whereas today, it simply requires a simple majority in the House and a simple majority in the Senate, plus the president's signature. And to change anything about this system, the articles required a unanimous vote of every single delegate simultaneously. Whereas the Constitution, while still very difficult to amend, is much more easy to amend, comparatively speaking, requiring only a two-thirds majority of each chamber in Congress or a three-fourths majority of the individual states. So what's, what's going on here? Well, I want you to understand that the Articles of Confederation did create a federal government, but that it created an intentionally weak federal government. In fact, it created what today we call a confederacy, but what the Articles themselves described as a firm league of friendship, similar to the modern European Union. Right? France is still a sovereign country, but it is also a member of the European Union. And if it didn't like the European Union, it could always leave. It doesn't necessarily have to follow the guidelines of the European Union, except that if it doesn't, it's no longer going to get to be a part of the team. So that's the way things work under the Articles of Confederation. And the federal government is kept weak because it's not designed to govern a country during peacetime. The federal government under the Articles of Confederation essentially handles war and diplomacy, so everything it needs to coordinate the effort in order to defeat the British Empire, to win the war. And in this sense, the Articles are a success. They govern our country for the first 10 years of its independent history, and what we're going to discover is that ultimately we do win the war under this system of government. However, the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation become apparent pretty much immediately after the Revolutionary War has concluded. And these weaknesses, like most things in history, pertain to and relate to and deal with money with taxes. All right, so remember what I told you on the preceding slide. Under the Articles of Confederation, the federal government could not levy any taxes. It could pass with a two-thirds majority vote what was called a requisition. A requisition was basically a request for each of the member states, the 13 independent sovereign states, to use their own authority at home to tax their citizens, to raise money, and then please send that money to the federal government so it can do things like pay our soldiers and win the war. It could not, however, say everyone in the entire country pay these taxes directly to us. So it was dependent upon voluntary compliance by the states. And during the war, that worked. Because when you've got redcoats breathing down your throat, hey, lo and behold, there's a pretty strong incentive to pay your fair share of the costs. But after the war, when the British leave our continent, the redcoats are gone, there's no immediate threat, and so people no longer see the point in paying these federal taxes and therefore the money dries up, and within a year of declaring victory, we're forced to disband our military because there's no more revenue because the federal government cannot levy direct taxes, and the states are no longer voluntarily sending their own money. This is exacerbated because after the war, we've just alienated our main trade partner, and so the economy's in shambles, and the states themselves are in horrible war debt, and so what do they do? Well, remember, under the Articles of Confederation, the regulation of commerce is left entirely to the states. 
which means that the states were able to do things like create tariffs on one another. A tariff is a tax on the transportation of goods from one state to the next or across national boundaries. And so what this meant is that if you wanted to transport goods from one state to the next, you would have to pay taxes every time you crossed those state borders. So let's say, for example, that you were a tobacco farmer in Virginia. You don't want to sell your tobacco in Virginia because everyone else in Virginia is also a tobacco farmer. And so to reach your audiences, you're going to have to travel. Let's say you want to go north and sell your goods in Maine. Well, then you're going to have to cross through Virginia and into Pennsylvania. You'll pay a tariff, a tax on the goods you're transporting when you cross that border. And then you've got to pass from Pennsylvania through New York. Well, New York is also going to have a tariff, so you've got to pay another tax against the value of your goods. And then you're going to go through Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and finally you reach in Maine. And by that time, you've paid more in taxes and tariffs on the transport of your goods across state borders than you're going to make selling them to your target consumers. And what this meant is that if you were a farmer at this time, it was essentially impossible to move your goods. If you can't move your goods to their target consumer base, you can't sell them, you can't make money. And so to keep their operations running, what did the farmers do? Well, they're forced to take loans. And that's fine at first. Like during the war, the banks are like, yeah, okay, everyone's at war. But after the war is over, they want those farmers to begin paying back the money they borrow which the farmers cannot do because the tariffs make it impossible for them to transport goods. And the federal government is powerless to intervene because it has no authority over interstate commerce. That's completely a state issue under the articles. And so these banks start going to the various states and say, hey, these people borrowed money. They promised to pay us back. They're not paying them back. And the states respond by taking these indebted farmers and throwing them into debtor's prison and saying, okay, you got to stay in the cell until you've paid back your debt. But of course, if you're in prison, you can't engage in labor to generate revenue with which to pay your debt. And so the farmers are indefinitely detained and they don't like this. And this is exacerbated even further because remember, horrible war debt at both the state and federal level means lots of new taxes. So what we're going to find then is that the farmers rise up in an event called Shays Rebellion. And in Shay's Rebellion, these farmers are basically going to seize a courthouse to prevent it from foreclosing on their loans. Now, eventually, the state of Massachusetts is able to wind up, rally up its own militia, and disband this unruly mob of indebted farmers. Law and order is eventually reinitiated. However, it takes some time. And it takes time because, remember, there's no federal army. So this begins to create concerns, right? The fact that we don't have an army to deal with these civil, uh, disobedient people, and the fact that we can't regulate interstate commerce being a big part of what caused the problem in the first place leads many people, especially the rich people like the bank owners, to feel that under the Articles of Confederation, our federal government is not strong enough. And therefore, they call for a constitutional convention that was originally envisioned as a discussion on how we can amend the Articles of Confederation to shore up some of these weaknesses, giving the federal government the power to do things like regulate interstate commerce and raise direct federal taxes. However, what we're going to discover next week is that instead of using this as an opportunity to amend the Articles of Confederation, the framers, the delegates at the Constitutional Convention, are going to draft an entirely separate document. But that's the end of the lecture for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please do your reading, and I'll see you next week.